Hello and welcome to A Second Look. My name is Emmett McConnell. In this series, I look back at a previous match in MLS and break down the big plays and goals. In this episode, I'm going to look back at last week's match between Atlanta United and the New York Red Bulls. The Red Bulls have yet to lose to Atlanta in regular season, and this match was no different as they took a 3-3 draw in stoppage time in Atlanta. Now in this game, it was pretty predictable what both teams wanted to do. Atlanta wanted to possess and play through the middle, while the Red Bulls pressed high up the field and tried to win the ball close to the opposing team's net. Let's take a second look. Before we get into the match, we need to understand the shape that each side set out to achieve. While both teams may have lined up in a 4-2-3-1, there were some stark differences to each. Mainly, Atlanta was set up to possess the ball, and as such, looked much more like a 4-3-3 when they had the ball. Red Bull, meanwhile, wanted to press, and as a result forced themselves into 1v1 situations all over the field, and ended up looking to play something more of a 3-4-1-2, where Kamar Lawrence, the left back, stepped up to Atlanta right back Franco Escobar. This left Kyle Duncan, Sean Nealis, and Amro Tarek to slide across and man-mark the front three of Justin Merrim, Joseph Martinez, and Julian Gressel. This often left openings as the rest of the squad was fairly free to press further up the field and in midfield. Despite the Red Bull press, Atlanta stuck to their guns and tried to possess, especially in the early minutes. Here is a 19-pass sequence that ultimately led to nothing. For the most part, while in possession of the ball, Atlanta was uncreative and lackadaisical. The Red Bulls didn't defend this deep often, and as a result, the few times Atlanta was able to get into the final third, resulted in attacks like this one, that just didn't ever look substantial. Here are a couple more situations where Atlanta was able to get out of its own half, but ultimately was unable to create convincing opportunities closer to goal. The tendency to pass side to side can be a great way to move defenses and find openings, but it's also easier to pick off and start a counterattack. Pity Martinez was one of the biggest perpetrators of lazy square passes, and lost possession on too many occasions like these. Even this clip, which is perhaps one of Atlanta's better chances in the match, was only created because Alex Moyle tried to dribble out of the box, as well as the referee then missing a foul. Atlanta's third goal is really the only time starting in advanced position paid off, and it was mostly down to Joseph Martinez's incredible ability as a forward, as he pulled off a backwards leaping header that clipped the bottom of the crossbar. Not exactly a play that can be replicated often. This clip will give a better idea of how the Red Bulls used continuous light pressure to force Atlanta to play side to side, and then allow New York to pounce when it gets into a position where they can win the ball back. It starts with a pass up the middle that is cut out, though Atlanta retains possession. They go back and reset through goalkeeper Brad Guzon, and the Red Bull front three isn't quick enough to force Guzon long, but is able to trap the ball with the fullback Franco Escobar. It's the left winger slash left forward Daniel Royer who is pressing center back Miles Robinson. So once again, it would be the left wing back Kamar Lawrence who steps to the opposite fullback. These are the exact situations where the Red Bull 3-4-1-2 is crucial in their attempts to press the Atlanta defense. Lawrence is quick to close Escobar from a long distance and forces the defender to put his head down after the first touch and limits his passing vision. This forces Escobar to take a big touch, which should in turn give him enough time to scan the field and look for the next pass or touch. Christian Caceres, who is marking the square outlet to Eric Rometty, quickly steps in and puts in a good tackle. Now the Red Bulls regain possession through Chatkovsky, who picks up the loose ball at the top of the box. Royer was potentially available here if the ball was played early enough and Brian White should have made this run into the open space vacated by Robinson. The third option is actually suitable enough in the end, though the square ball to Moyle doesn't actually challenge Guzan on the final shot. The beginning of this clip is the direct result of a Red Bull long ball. I don't want to get too into the Red Bull strategy in possession just yet, but keep in mind their tendency to play the ball forward directly into the final third. This attempt of a combination to the corner doesn't work, but like most of the match, Christian Caceres Jr. gets things going. 
He was my man of the match for this one, and is a consensus heir to Tyler Adams' role in the Red Bull midfield. Let's keep him highlighted for the duration of this play. Caceres creates a scramble in the box, and Atlanta eventually clean up the loose ball. But what was so impressive about the Red Bull press in this match wasn't winning the first ball, but the second and the third. Caceres wins it back again, but there's a mix-up with Chotkovsky, and Atlanta get it back. But here it is, more follow-up attempts from the Red Bulls, and again they win the ball in the Atlanta half of the field. It's then one, two forward passes in an attempt to get into goal. Now let's look at how this pressure led to the Red Bulls scoring their first goal. It starts with Red Bulls launching a pass and moving the play deep in Atlanta territory. Even without retaining possession, this is where the Red Bulls wanted to play. Daniel Royer began this press close to the center circle, forces Guzan to go long, and ultimately finishes the playoff with the goal. The Atlanta keeper tries to be too clever when he clips the ball over Alex Moyle. The wingers prepared, and Moyle is right on Mikey Ambrose's first touch. Ambrose was likewise too confident in the decision to control the ball, and should have corrected Guzan's decision by hooking the ball along with his first touch. The first instinct now upon winning the ball for Moyle is forward and into the dangerous area on top of the box and in front of the Atlanta center backs. Chadkovsky then slides it to Royer, and for the second time in this series, the inexperience of the Atlanta fullbacks helps Red Bull. Franco Escobar sees Royer stretch his left leg and takes a chance to try to win the ball. He anticipates that Royer's touch will take him forward, but Royer kills the ball on the spot and Escobar overcommits. This allows Royer to cut back away from Escobar onto his left foot and elevate his shot over the recovering defender. I've shown a few clips now, so you should have gotten the gist of the Red Bull plan of attack, which was keep the offense as simple as possible and only play the ball forward. That meant either a single, direct pass forward into a midfielder or forward's feet, where they would then try a through ball from that more advanced position, or a simple long ball over the back of the defense. The result of which was either the Red Bulls gaining possession in a forward position, or that the Red Bulls could instead try to pressure the Atlanta defense close to their own net and win the ball in that advanced position. At times, Atlanta tried to counter this by sitting deeper, and playing long balls of their own, only to stay in a deep block once Red Bull regained possession, again in the hopes of being in a good spot to defend the incoming long ball. The second Red Bull goal comes from a quick, clinical attack off a short set piece. Sean Davis gets the quick pass from Kyle Duncan, and plays it into Daniel Royer under pressure from Franco Escobar and Darlington Nagby. He plays it first time, again forward, but it looks like it's somewhere between Christian Caceres and Alex Moyle, who are both making vertical runs. The confusion also affects substitute defender Michael Parkhurst, who overruns the pass as it slips past him. Once Moyle can pick his head up, he notices that Escobar has stepped to Royer, Parkhurst has missed the pass, and Mikey Ambrose was caught out of position before the ball even reached Royer. That leaves just Miles Robinson, who sees Caceres and steps up to pick up the run, which allows Moyle to roll it beyond him to the wide open Brian White. Now when we see the replay, we can notice that Caceres actually makes an incredibly important run. As he cuts inside, he takes Parkhurst with him. That takes his momentum away from the incoming pass and makes it impossible for him to stop and readjust in time. And he's taken out of the play. Caceres then peels off as Robinson steps up, which makes the space for White. I've said it before, but Caceres was easily my man of the match. I've shown you just a few small things he's done, so let's just look at a few more, including his eventual game-tying assist. It's easy to see why so many Red Bull fans rate him. Not only does he run tirelessly and make important open field tackles, but he can also make the difficult, cutting pass that breaks open opposing defenses. This is directly after the Joseph Martinez go-ahead goal. Caceres picks up the ball around half-field, and even though he has run non-stop all game, makes this run into the Atlanta final third and clips an almost impossible ball behind the Atlanta defense for the impeccable poacher Bradley Wright Phillips. Credit should be given to Alex Moyle, though he's tired and gives up on this ball, the quick attempt to get on the end of the pass beats Miles Robinson into stepping up, which is what allows this ball to get behind him and to the feet of Wright Phillips. 
The most dangerous moments for either side in the end came from Red Bull set pieces. It wasn't that Red Bull were dangerous, but actually the opposite. Atlanta only initiated counterattacks off of Red Bull free kicks, and each time looked like a goal might come off of it. Those situations were reminiscent of the years under Tata Martino when Joseph Martinez and Miguel Almiron would break at pace and tear his defenses apart. I would have liked it if they had tried it a bit more often when recovering possession, but these moments were a joy to watch. Looking specifically at the opening goal, it wasn't even Atlanta's best counter from a Red Bull set play. They recovered possession in the Red Bull midfield, but were able to play Pity Martinez into a position where he could run at the Red Bull defense. The ensuing play was more of a misread by Kyle Duncan than a good pass from Pity, however, who slightly underhits the ball for Justin Merrim. Duncan tries to step wide, anticipating that the pass will go to the outside. Instead, it comes short, and Merrim cuts inside the defender as he is turning out. It's a really smooth touch and read from Merrim, who seems to have found his feet back in Atlanta. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.